what are you building with? And kind of the, the idea behind 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is a continuance of what Paul was speaking about in regards to this issue in chapter 1. And remember that the issue really is what has most likely caused, for the most part, the problems in the church at Corinth. And the issue was contentions. We've been talking about this for a little bit only because this was very important to Paul's heart. Remember that, that when Paul expressed all the things that he had gone through in his walk, this is Paul kind of going through, uh, you know, his suffering for the cause of Christ. Uh, he was fully aware that he would suffer as a, as a man of God. It's, it's what Jesus said would happen to him there in Acts chapter 9 when you look at, uh, you know, Paul's testimony and his conversion. Um, Jesus made it very clear through revelation that Paul would suffer for the sake of the kingdom. And Paul then kind of gives us a resume of his suffering. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he lays out pretty much his entire ministry of suffering, if you want to call it that. But I want to focus on one part and it's in verse 28 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says this in verse 28, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. My deep concern for all the churches. So after addressing in verses 22 through 27 of all the things that he has suffered at the hands of others, due to his faith in Christ and the various places that he went to to preach the gospel. Some communities received him. Other communities rejected him. Some communities, they welcomed him. Other communities left him for dead. And this is what he expresses. This has been my life of faith as an apostle. But in verse 28, he says, what has been the most of his suffering, the most of his worry, the most of his concern, the most that's been on his heart, not everything he suffered for Jesus as if I did all this for you. Now, what do I got coming to me? Because remember, he was told very early on this would happen to you. And he still chose to follow Christ. The greatest concern in Paul's life should be the greatest concern to any devoted man or woman of God. And that is this, beside these other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. So it wasn't only outward, but it was inward also. It was also that of emotion, not just physical, because of his deep affection for the body of Christ and the churches that Paul himself was very much so engaged in planting. And remember, it was the people at Corinth here, this body of believers that Paul had spent most of his time with. About a year and a half as he labored side by side, pouring into them and, and, and receiving this news here, he pretty much closes out chapter two with these terms. And he's saying, you know, basically what's being shown here is that you're carnal. And he starts off in chapter three, introducing this third type of person. He says, you're either, you're either worldly or you're spiritual, but there is those who profess to be spiritual, but their actions are worldly. And Paul is introducing this thought and this idea, and he's saying the third person here is the carnal person. See, he says the natural man doesn't understand the things of the spirit because he's not spiritually discerned. So he's not spiritual, but, but the spiritual man judges all things. He himself is rightly judged by no one can be judged by God, but, but here's the point. He is a spiritual man. He gives the contrast between the two. How does one become spiritual? By way of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God indwells the believer, and it's the Spirit of the Lord that searches the deep things of God. He just laid it out, and he says these are the two types. But, but here's my problem, Paul is saying. 
he, he says this, I brethren. He's not talking to, to anybody else. He's speaking to those who are of the body of Christ. He says, I brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. As to babes in Christ. They were not spiritually or fully controlled by the Holy Spirit, is the point that he's saying. In other words, he says, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes, immature. You see, their carnality was indicative of their immaturity. We talked a little bit about that last week, but... But so he kind of lays it out and he says, how did we get here? You see, it's always better to address and deal with an issue right away than to allow it to linger and build and gain momentum, especially in the body of Christ. If Paul would have got word that these divisions started among these groups within the church at Corinth, Perhaps they would have not allowed it to get as far as they did. It seems that this division at Corinth spread to a greater degree that, that now Paul needs to come and do damage control and remind them of getting back to the essentials of what it is to be a church. So when you look at it from this perspective, what Paul is not talking about is organized religion. He's not saying, I need to teach you how to be a greeter. I need to teach you how to pick up tithes and offerings. I need to teach you how to tell the worship team, pay, play five songs, and then the sermon is, is 45 minutes, and then you, know, you have a time of prayer after. And this is how, he's not talking about organized religion. He's talking about what the purpose and mission of the church is. And the purpose and mission of the church is so that Christ is exalted. And here he's saying, really, this is not the case. In one sense, you have them saying, Apollos is exalted. Paul is exalted. Cephas is exalted. Oh, and yeah, Christ is exalted, but, but they're the religious ones, right? He says, I fed you with milk, not with solid food. Literally, what he's saying here is he's saying that he fed them. He was their spiritual father. I brought you up. I birthed this work into being. He says, I know what I taught you. I know what I've poured into you. And, and, and here's, here's how we kind of look at it this way. What, what, in essence, what Paul is saying is he's saying, what I've taught you, it's, it's not, I don't see it. I'm seeing something totally different. And you can easily tell when a person clearly begins to, to stray from the essentials of the Christian faith and or the purpose and mission of the faith when they begin to introduce their own ideals or ideologies. You begin to see a lesser approach to faithfulness to the Lord, yet there might be a little sprinkling of some verses maybe added in there, some, some false humility, if you will, some understanding of, yes, you know, this, I, you know, I still love the Lord, but, but you know, I just, I just know that, that I got to be doing Whatever the case might be, Paul says, here I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. The simplicity. The simplicity of the gospel is, is, is what keeps us coming back to understanding that this is really nothing of us, but it's all of him. And that is a good point to have. I fed you with milk, not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And, and he says, and, and now you are still not able to receive it. It's still not possible. 
Why is it not possible? Because their actions show that they're still immature. In a sense, you could say that, that Paul perhaps is proposing to them maybe this thought, and let me interject this as you look at the text. Perhaps he's saying to them, and this is just a thought to interject, perhaps he's saying to them, you should be past this by now. Though I might have fed you with milk, it was still enough to take you further than where you are. So in a sense, it's not that Paul is saying, you know, maybe I didn't feed you enough and it was my fault or the word of God was not strong enough and, and it's the word's fault. No, what he's saying is you were fed right. You were fed according to the measure that, that you would understand. So, yeah, in, in one case, you don't go and preach a theological sermon to people that, that don't understand these large words of, 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 of theology, right? You don't, you don't do that because you miss them. I mean, I am not a very, uh, how could I say, uh, I, I'm not like, you know, this great orator, all right? You guys know that. There's a lot of hood in Pastor Dave, okay? But... You know, it's funny when I hear people say, you know, you just sound so educated. I like if I'm drinking something, I'm ready to spit out whatever I'm drinking. I'm just like, really? Uh, is that what an, an educator sounds like? Or they'll say something like, you sound just real like, you know, if they haven't seen me yet, they haven't put a face. All they hear is the voice. And then they come and they see me and they're like, this is David Zamora. Like, why? Why? Why wouldn't it be? You know, why, why wouldn't it be? You know, and I had a, I had a relative of mine that, that um, you know, hadn't seen me in years. I'm talking years, since like, you know, years, since the mid-90s. And they have been on vacation for a long time. So they were at one point <laughs> moved to another vacation destination close by. And my mom said, hey, I think you get this station that David comes out on and you need to listen to him. Like, they're like, yeah, let's do it. So they, they listen and the next time they call, you know, home from vacation, <laughs> he said to my mom, that's not David. He's like, I was waiting for him. He never came out. And, you know, she's like, that's him. He goes, no, that can't be him. It sounds like some white guy, man. <laughs> now, mind you, this was my crime partner for a number of years. So my mom said, that, that's him. That's, that's how he sounds now. That's him. <laughs> he don't talk like you, no. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, you know, it, 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 it was funny, but, but at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> we, we try to communicate the gospel as simply as we possibly can. And <laughs> I've had people tell me, you use words that are too big. Literally, your words that you use are too big. I'm still trying to figure out which word that is. Because I don't know big words. Half the time, I don't even know how to pronounce them. So I'm doing like the brethren, 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 brethren. That's how you spell it. Okay, good. No, you know, th literally, that's how I do it. I have a dictionary next to a book I'm reading because there's certain words I'm like, what is that word? Then I'll try to guess. I'll sound it out. I'll say it a couple of times. This is what it means. Then I'll look it up. Totally not what it means. But, <laughs> but is that, that's how you learn, right? But, but here's the point. If we come with great words, we're this great you know, type of wordy, right? You'll lose your audience. The gospel is not wordy. It's simple. Paul says, I fed you. The, the idea behind feed here would be as you feed a child, you, you spoon feed them. You give them just enough. You, you don't overdo it. You don't overfeed them. And you don't underfeed them. But you feed them. And 
like a parent feeds a child. I fed you with milk and, and not with solid food. He, he's talking about the word of God, how he taught them the word of God. And, and he says, this is the purpose of it for your growth. And then as you grow, you should be able then to take on more solid food, meaning more deeper things in the word of God. Because as you guys know, the word of God can 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 get deep. I, I don't think the words, listen to this, I don't think the words get deep because they have so many different translations today that you can figure out what the text says, right? By just getting a different translation. But when you get into the concepts and ideas behind doctrine, boy, there's sometimes I've sat in some lectures, two, three hour lectures, and I'm just like, what, why am I sitting in here? Like, what did I get myself into? And but they're needful. When you're there at that place in your walk, you can, you can take those things in, you can learn those things, and then you have a deeper appreciation for certain ideas in the scriptures. Paul is saying here, I, I fed you better than this. And the way I fed you was to lead you on to maturity. This is what he's talking about here, to maturity, okay? So you should be more stronger in your walk. Remember that even in the scriptures, as, as the apostles are encouraging the church, it says many of you ought to be teachers by now. There is an element in which we are to be growing. But he's saying it's evident that you are not able to receive it because you guys are divided in the church. Apollos has become your Jesus. I have become your Jesus. Cephas has become your Jesus. And he even goes on to say, and there are some of you that claim that you're following Jesus. Is Christ divided? No, he's not. And because you are all practicing divisiveness and division in the body of Christ, it is very clear that you're not ready for solid food. Your actions testify of it. So once again, their immaturity, their, their, as they're immature, their carnality was indicative of their immaturity. Now look at this. He goes on to say here, for you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Well, what's the problem with mere men? He just talked about how mere men discern things. What does he say? They are undiscerning. Mere men cannot discern like spiritual men. That's why he gave this contrast. And he's saying, you, you see, as the church, we are not to carry ourselves this way. The context is division. This was the sin here. Listen, God adds and God subtracts, but he doesn't divide. He doesn't divide. And so he goes on, and, and I think this is important. Why? Because Paul is speaking to the church. He's speaking to the body of Christ. You, listen, as a church, we have a purpose. We have a mission in this world, we have a call, a duty that we are called to, and that is this. It's not, let me use this term, no man is an island. No man is an island. As we get a couple of chapters in, perhaps maybe, what, eight chapters in, we'll, we'll hit, uh, you know, chapter 12. And Paul describes to the same group of people, pay attention to this, he describes to the same group of people that the body of Christ is different members, but one body. Hands, feet, eyes, mouth. You know, he just lays it all out. And he says they all, the, the one can't say to the other, I have no need of you. The, your, your, your hands need your eyes and your eyes need your hands. Your hands won't know where, where to grab or what to grab if it's not for your eyes showing them where and, you know, vice versa. The hand won't know where to go. But here's the point. Various members in the body, various gifts, that's 1 Corinthians 12, but one body. And this is the point that he's bringing him to. And he says, listen to this. You're behaving like carnal men. 
Now, granted that some of us, well, not some of us, all of us have carnality in us, right? The carne, the flesh. <laughs> you know, we say, he's all in the carne right now, man. Don't go over there. You know, listen, we all have carnality in us, but it's not that we say, well, that's just what I am. I'm just carnal. No, no, Paul is saying when it comes to the church, here's what it is. We've been bought and purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, you know, the scriptures say that we are no longer our own. You're not your own. You've been bought at a price. You belong to the Lord now, right? Now, what we battle with is this flesh, is this carnality. And remember that division is really a form of pride. At the heart of division is pride. And remember that it was pride that got Lucifer kicked out of heaven. That's what Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12, jot it down if you're taking notes, Isaiah 14. In verse 12, you'll see it begins to start there, this description of Lucifer. It, 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 it reveals what his purpose and his mission was. He wanted to be like God. So he wanted to set his throne up, right? And then what happened? What was he going to do in heaven? There's, there's no room for two thrones in heaven. But Lucifer didn't see a problem with there being another throne. What would ultimately happen if there's two thrones? Division. What's at the heart of his mission? To divide the heavenly host. And this is why Paul then would even tell Timothy, hey, you don't lay hands on somebody who's young. Don't lay hands on a new believer. You know, new believers aspire to do a lot of things. I think that new believers need to really go through some training. Through some training. Well, I've been serving God for, for one year. You're still a baby Christian. Well, I've been serving God for, for three years. You're still a baby Christian. There's still a lot of things you're learning. Some people don't stop practicing the things that they were practicing before they came to faith. Clearly, one or two years into their Christianity, they struggle so much. And it's not an excuse. And they have to give an account for the bad witness they purported to others. But here's the point. Training is important. And that's why Paul says, hey, listen, yeah, we're gonna, we'll lay hands on people. We'll raise people up. But, but don't just grab the guy that just got saved and get him off the street and say, all right, now you're going to preach next Sunday. It doesn't work that way. It's in training, what we call discipleship, that, that a lot of these things are worked out. And they begin to learn of what's expected. See, the issue is not, are they capable? I think a lot of us are capable of doing anything that pertains to the church. Listen to this. Hey, can you come and open the church? Of course I'm capable of going and opening the church. If I got the time and I get off of work early, I can be there to open it for you. Hey, you think you can clean the restrooms on the weekend here at the church before Sunday service? Obviously I'm capable of doing that. Hey, do you think you're capable of running our audio or me, uh, media, whatever? Yeah, I, I mean, listen, the capability, that's, that's really not the issue. There are people who don't teach the word and are just good at communicating. They're teachers by nature. But if you're not instructed in the things of the Lord, empowered by the Spirit, and know that what you're doing is not for your honor, but for His, that's where you have to learn that it's a privilege to get to do what we do for the Lord. It's not a I know how. It's that I get to. It's like church. It's like Bible study. It's like tonight. Listen, some of you were like... I got to go to church or I have to go to church. I mean, if that was the case, then you might as well just close your stuff up now and bounce. You ain't going to get nothing out of the Bible study tonight. But if you say, I have to go to church, I have to be there. Or I get to, excuse me, I get to go to church today. I get to, I get to be a part of fellowship. I'm tired, but man, I get to go to church tonight. Or I'm tired, I get to go and serve a lot of tired people serving in the children's ministry right now and are probably thinking, man, Pastor David, he's long-winded on Wednesdays. <laughs> I get to. I'm long-winded all the time, so deal with it. But, but here's the point. It's, it's I get to. And you know what? That's what training does. 
it makes one more appreciative of the work that's before them. It's easy to forget that we get to, but it's also easy to remember that we have to. It's easy to forget that we get to, but it's also easy to remember that we have to. I don't want to remember that I have to. I want to remember that I get to. Keeping it simple, staying away from carnality. Listen to this. How do we do this? Well, listen, some people say, well, how do I get out of this funk? Listen to this. When you make it about Christ and not about others, it will always be, I get to. That's a very good point. When you make it about Christ and not about others, it's I get to. When your walk is about other people here and what others are doing and what others are saying and not saying and doing and not doing, then it becomes, oh, I have to go over there. Oh, I have to face him. Oh, I have to be. You guys see what I'm talking about? Okay, good. I get to. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? You know what the answer is? Most of your Bibles have a question mark, doesn't it? You know what the answer is? Yes. That's carnality. When your comforts are placed above the purpose and mission of the church, it's carnality. Now, I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it again. How many of you guys have ever been offended in church by somebody? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. Raise, raise your hand. Somebody got you upset. Come on, you got hurt. Don't try to be all spiritual. Like, I forgave them. I, for, <laughs> I forget. I forget, pastor. I get to forget. I get to forget. No, listen. How many of you guys have been offended by somebody in the church? Seriously, they get you upset. Your spouse. Come on, let's get real. Your sibling, they're part of the church. You're looking at them like, no, they're not. You know, they're, they need to get saved. No, listen, we've been offended, right? And we've wanted to leave. We've, we've wanted to leave the church. Now, let's just get one thing straight. You don't really leave church if you're going to another church. You're just leaving that church. But people say like, I left the church. Like, how? You're right here in church right now. Oh, I mean that church. Well, listen, it's all the body of Christ. But here's the point. Some people leave and it has nothing to do with anything other than that they're upset. They're in the flesh. They get offended and, 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 and they get carnal. And they, but, but you can't tell them because they're offended. Okay? And I remember one person came to me and they says, you know, I want to talk to you. I says, okay. I'm leaving the church. And I said, which church? And they're like, this church. I said, why? They said, well, because I didn't see any problems. Well, you know, I had this issue, and they just laid out the whole problem. It had to do with the ministry within our church, and they just weren't jiving with the leader, and I don't know what happened, man. It's, it was like, and I just says, well, you know, because when I start to, like, cut you off in the middle of your conversation, you, it's because you're giving me too many details, and I'm not willing to be your cheerleader. So I'm just, well, okay, well, yeah, okay, listen, look, 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 look. So did you try to go and talk to this person? Yeah, but they, this, okay. So did you share with anybody else? Yeah, but this, okay. So, so basically right now, you're just upset. Yes, I am. I said, well, let's pray. Okay. So we prayed and all I did was just, Lord, help them with this because what they're starting to feel is turning into bitterness. And they're be starting to become, you know, Getting in the flesh. They're starting to say some things. When they start saying things like, you know, you know, you know, back in the day, you know, when they, you know, when they go there, that's already like, okay, okay, I, I, I get it. Yeah, we're a hoodie church, so that happens a lot. But, but here's the point. <laughs> here's the point. I, I, I say, okay, so this is now beyond your ability to control your emotion. You're, you're like really upset. You're really upset. You're hurt. 
So I'll pray for the hurt. I'll pray that God will help them with that. And then I just tell them this. I go, well, here, here's what you need to do. You need to pray. Because maybe God is using this to help you. You know, it, you know is, it, is it anything here? No, it's not the teaching. It's you're a great pastor. It's not you. It's, you know, all this stuff. And I says, you know, there's really no reason to leave a body of Christians unless the word of God is not being taught properly. They're preaching Christ, you know, salvation through someone or something other than Christ or, you know, just, you know, the leadership, the elders in open blatant sin, you know, and whatever the case might be. And I explained this to them. And then, you know, they kind of started, I mean, their mind was set. And then I said this, it says, you probably think I don't know what you feel. And they said, God, nobody's going to treat you that way. I says, you'd be surprised. I have been disrespected in this church. I have been talked about behind my back. I have had things said to me. And then right after they call me to go pray for their loved one in the hospital. I've been, ta- I've been, all kinds of stuff's been said about me. I says, when do I get to leave? Because it's easy for me just to leave and go somewhere else where I'm wanted, right? But when do I get to leave? I can't. I got to stay. I, I ain't got no choice. I'm stuck with you. <laughs> but I says, here's what I will tell you. The carnality that you demonstrated at the start of this Where is it now? You know what they said? You're right. You're right. You don't get, you got to stay here and face. I says, yeah. So how do you do that? I'm like, well, if you stick around, you can see. And you know what they said? I'll stick around. And the person that told me that is still here in this church today. And they know who they are. And it's been 10 years. Close to that. They're still here. Still here. Now, here's the ideal and the picture in all of this is sometimes we think that we can act carnal to our benefit as if God would understand. Look at what Paul begins to lay out. So, The church is comprised of a body of believers who are to go on to maturity, right? I think last week we said the church is comprised of a body of believers who are united and not divided, right? In verse 5, he goes on to say here that the church itself is comprised of believers working together And then God gets the glory. God gets the increase. So he says here, listen to this. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed. As the Lord gave to each one. So all we are is just the instruments that God used to bring you to Christ. That's what he's saying right there. That's all we are. We're nothing more than that. We, we've done nothing more for you. We, we didn't do anything for you to believe in us and put your faith in us and, and worship us. He says we were just the instruments that God used to bring you to faith. But ministers through whom you believed, and look at what he says here, as the Lord gives to each one. So Christ gave them the ministry. Christ gave them the ministry. I've always said this to people. Listen, the ministry is not yours. It could never be yours. It's it's the Lord's. And so know that with that, it's hands off. It's, It's by God's grace that you're able to do what you get to do. Right? 
Look at this. He says, as the Lord gave to each one. Now, remember Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says that when the Lord, he ascended, he gave gifts. He gave gifts unto them. And, and I've always liked this passage because Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And uh, you could turn there if you'd like. There's a couple of verses there that I think are important to take note of. But, but I want to start in verse 7. Why? Because he's talking about the uniqueness of the believers, the uniqueness of the believers. He says, but to each one of us, grace was given. Now, now this is what's supposed to counteract carnality. Rather than show the flesh or the work of the flesh or our carnal nature, we are to be demonstrating this measure of grace that, that God has given us. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So we have a unique gift that God gave us. Therefore, he says, he... When he ascended on high, he led captive and gave gifts to men. So, so Jesus conquered and he led captivity captive. You guys understand what that means there? Captivity captive. Meaning that Jesus set the captives free. So Paul uses this same thought taken from Psalm 68 in verse 18 where where, where David elaborates on God's victory over his enemies. And the trophies that David brought in as this great victory, Paul is kind of saying here, this thought from the Psalms, he's saying, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. This is what they would do. They would come in and they would defeat and they would conquer and they would bring the spoils and then they would give gifts to the men. And he's saying, this is what Jesus did because Jesus conquered. He says, now we are here recipients of his victory, not anything on our part. You see, carnality will want to take credit for something that you didn't do. But grace clearly causes you to understand that it's only by his grace and his grace alone that you get to do. Now, some people will probably look at that and say, well, what's the fun in it? There's a lot of fun in it. There's a blessedness in it. There's a joy in it. As a matter of fact, of all people, his grace was bestowed upon you and he's using you. He could be using anybody else, but look at you. He's using you. Because God doesn't call the qualified as we have on that sign back there. He qualifies the called. It's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now look at what he says. Now when he ascended, what does it mean but also that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So there are two ways that people take this passage of scripture. Now, I, I got to say it because it is something that I think now is a little bit solid for you to be chewing on. But there's two ways of looking at this. Number one, some would say that this is speaking about Jesus coming down from heaven to the earth, to the lower parts of the earth, coming like down to the muck and mire of humanity. And then he ascended on high. And others will say, this also has the idea, perhaps, that Jesus, when he ascended to the lower parts of the earth, it's talking about Sheol or Hades, or the place also known as the bosom of Abraham, found in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. And some would take the story of Luke chapter 16 and they would say, you see, when a person dies, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, they both go to the place called Hades or Sheol. There the righteous would be separated in the bosom of Abraham where the righteous went and the unrighteous went where the rich man went. And remember, there was no way that one can cross over because there was a great chasm fixed between the two. And some would say that at some point when Jesus ascended, perhaps most likely in the time that took place in the book of Acts in chapter 1, as the apostles were gazing upon him as he was taken up, and then the angels appeared and they said, in the same way that you've seen him ascending, you will also see him descending with the clouds of glory. In other words, he's coming back again, just like Jesus said he would 
in John chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have not told you. But I will go and I will come and receive you unto myself. So that where I am, there you may be also. So he's saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to come back. And the angels testified of it in Acts chapter 1. So it's believed that at the time that Christ ascended, he led captivity captive. That those that were in the bosom of Abraham came out of a place known as paradise, and then they were taken to the presence where God is because no one could get there until Christ did the work that he did at the cross. That's one aspect of it. Some totally dismiss that teaching. Uh, we can't follow that pattern in scripture, but it is a thought, perhaps, Jesus also did tell Mary of Magdalene, go tell my brethren that I go to our father. Remember that? And it wasn't until eight days later that he was then seen by Thomas the doubter. And it was at the time when he told Mary, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to the father. I have not yet ascended. And then he sees Thomas and he says, touch me. He told her not to touch him but he tells Thomas, touch me. Some also take that to mean and believe that perhaps in between that eight-day period that we have no recognition of where Jesus was, no accounting, no recording at all whatsoever, that perhaps maybe this is where he fulfilled, where the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he offered his own blood, that he went into the heavenlies and offered his own blood. Some would say perhaps maybe that's what he did. He fulfilled the role of the high priest. He offered the sacrifice himself, and the high priest could not be touched before he went into the Holy of Holies to offer up on the Day of Atonement, but then could only be handled after the sacrifice was received and all of Israel knew that their sins were atoned for for another year. A lot to play in there. Pretty powerful, right? It's a lot to consider. And if you stay tuned, I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> it's a little bit of both. Anyways. It says here, he who descended also was the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor and teachers. Now notice how it says pastor and teachers. There's a lot of people that'll tell you these are the five-fold ministry of God. They'll say it like that, five-fold uh, it's not, okay? It's not fivefold ministry. It's fourfold. Because preacher, teacher is one and the same. You can't be one without the other. It's the same gift. So he gave gifts unto them, and these gifts were given to the apostles and to the church for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, listen to this, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, why do we talk about this in regards to chapter three? Because he's saying here very clearly that they were ministers through whom you believed. That it was the Lord who gave each one, each one a gift as he ascended. As his task was finished, However, we view that Jesus ascended on high. He led captivity captive. In other words, he took those that were captive in the bosom of Abraham. And here's just another thought on that, just to trip you guys out a little bit. You know, in 1 Peter 3, in 18 and 19, it says, you know, that he, that he went and preached to the spirits in prison. And everybody always asks me, what does that mean that Jesus went and preached through the eternal spirit? He went and preached to the spirits in prison. What does that mean? Well, it, the word preach there is not the Greek word where we get the English word evangelize. It's Caruso. He made a proclamation. He proclaimed. It says these were the ones who were disobedient in the days of Noah. And some would say that this is what Jesus did in the time in which he was in the tomb. And he went to that place that is known as the bosom of Abraham. And he proclaimed. What did he proclaim? He didn't preach the gospel because... What did Abraham say in Luke 16? There's no second chance. So obviously, he didn't, there were some that really believed Jesus preached the gospel and everybody got saved. And that Jesus became born again down there as well. False teaching. Don't believe it. But here's my thought. 
perhaps Jesus made this proclamation and said, like what the book of Hebrews says, that Abraham waited for the promise from afar off. Abraham looked to the city whose builder and maker is God. Could it be that Jesus said, Abraham, I'm the promise you've been waiting for from afar off. Let me now take you to the city whose builder and maker is God. Oh, I love that picture. You can't find it in the Bible, but it's just a thought that I had. Boy, that would be so cool, man. But here's what it is. Jesus' ministry on earth finished, and he handed the task over to the church. The purpose and mission of the church is to do the ministry of the body of Christ. Listen, you cannot serve the true purpose and mission of the church if you're carnal. You cannot serve the purpose and ministry of the church if it's about you building your kingdom. Let me put it to you this way. Doing things your way. Wanting to do it your way. That doesn't work that way. No matter how you do it, you could try to make yourself feel good. At the end of the day, you just need to be doing what God's called you to do. And he will equip you to do that work. He will, he will make it all work out. If we, if, if, if we say, well, Lord, I'll only do it if I know it's going to feel good. I'll only do it if I know I'm going to be taken care of. I'll only do it if I... Then listen, you'll never get around to doing it. You will always pussyfoot around things and never accomplish the task that God's called you to do. What's the danger in that? Well, I'll show you. Look at what he goes on to say. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You see, Christ gave them the ministry. That's what Ephesians 4 says. And Paul and Apollos were the means, but God was the cause. Paul and Apollos were the means, but God was the cause. Now, guys, listen, God should always be the cause. We can't take credit for anything. And look at what he says. I planted Apollos watered, but God. I love that. Not only is the but God for the work of the, uh, for the, work of the ministry, but it is also for the work of your salvation. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 is all about. It's like you were this and you were that and you were caught up in this and you were caught up in that. But God, who is rich in mercy. Do you guys realize that this is how we've come to where we are tonight, even in this Bible study here? That it's by the grace of God that, that we can grow in the things of God, be challenged in our hearts, stirred in our spirit, reminded of what our purpose and mission is, and if you take in what God is speaking to you today, there should be an element in your heart right now where you're saying, I need to stop doing this and I need to stop doing that because I want to serve God the way he's laid it out for the church to be. I want to be a part of the church. Jesus would say, it's simple. It's like John chapter four. The father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, what does it mean in spirit and in truth? In truth means that we can only worship God properly through the person and work of Jesus Christ. In spirit, it could only reach heaven by way of and ministry of the Holy Spirit that resides in us. You see, we can't worship God or serve him any other way except in spirit and in truth, in Christ and through the spirit. And so he says here, but God gives the increase. Guys, listen, God takes the burden of us having to build something so massive, so big, so great. And listen to this, when you just focus on the Lord receiving the glory, it relieves you of so much. I'm often asked the question, man, bro, you know, you, you, you got your hands in a lot of things. You're, you're doing a lot. And it's amazing to see what God's doing in your life. And I'm often met with all that. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, but it's not because of me. It's only by God's grace that I get to be a part of these things. And I, occasionally, I might open my big mouth and commit to something. And then God has to clean it up and fix it for me. But that's okay. It's all a matter of taking risks and taking steps of faith. Now, people might not see it, but that's okay. That's, that's, that's God's job, not yours. You don't got to sell God's vision to people. 
You just got to live it out. Eventually, if they desire to, to be filled with the Spirit and want to serve the Lord, they're, they're going to jump on board. They're going to want to be a part of this, whatever it might be, all for the advancement of his kingdom. God's the cause. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters. So the planters and the waterers, he's saying, relax. You're taking your planting too serious, dude. And you, water boy, relax. Right? <laughs> He said, you know, it's like, hey, you know, I am the best planter Christianity has. Yeah, but you ain't nothing without me. I got to water it in order for it to grow. I think sometimes we take our ministries too serious and we build them bigger than what God is in our life. And if it's your ministry that has you tied into your Christianity then you're not really serving God out of a heart that is thankful for the forgiveness of sins. You're, you're serving God out of duty. It becomes ceremony, tradition. And the one who does that will be the most miserable just sitting and listening. The greatest ministry is the ministry of the heart. That's a ministry that constantly needs work, and that's the ministry that you're in charge of. He goes on to say here this. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters, listen to this, are one. You see, therefore, God alone should get the credit, but also their united effort was to bring the church to maturity. God gets the glory, but we're one. Complementing one another's ministry. The Bible says... That a house divided against itself cannot stand. Remember that? Jesus said it. He says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that's Matthew 12, right? And, and remember, they were accusing Jesus of what? Casting out demons by him being a demon. They were, they were disregarding the work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they were saying, Jesus, your ministry, your ministry that you're doing is not of God. It is not truth. Jesus then kind of, he just lays it on him. He's saying, well, how, how does this work then? How can it be that I'm a demon casting out demons? Because that's what they said. The only reason why the demons are listening to him is because he's a demon himself. And Jesus said, well, what purpose does that serve? Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. And if Jesus laid that out to them, to the religious leaders, and then I love what he says. I, I love what he says, man. Check this out. He goes on to say this. What does he say? So then by whom do your men cast them out by? Because they had their exorcist guys, right? That the Pharisees had their, they were casting out, I exorcise the demon, Right? But, but, <laughs> please don't do that if we ever pray over somebody. But anyways, listen to this. The interesting thing with this that I think is remarkable, they were, they were shocked by Jesus because Jesus did things that nobody ever did. No, like seriously. Like he healed a leper. There, Jesus, what did he tell them? He's like, go and show the priest. Because that had never been done. I mean, it's mind-blowing. And they're like, wow, this, okay, so, okay, so here's another one. Check this out. If you were deaf and, 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 and mute and couldn't talk, they believed it was a demon. And so because you couldn't hear or talk, they could never cast the demon out because they would ask the demon his name. Mark chapter 5, Jesus asked the demon his name. Various times Jesus asked the demon their name. Because the school of thought according to the Pharisees and Judaism, that when you would go and cast a demon out, when you would exercise a demon, 
you have to ask it its name and then for it to come out. Well, if they were deaf and, you know, mute, then they were damned forever. It's like they're going to hell. The demon's never going to come out. Jesus comes on the scene. He's like, the deaf guy's hearing, the blind guy's seeing, the mute guy's speaking. They're like, whoa. How is he doing stuff like this? The demons are afraid of him. They're like, right now is not our time, Jesus. You know, we know the word too. We know in the end, you know, there's still some time, right? They did. Read Mark chapter 5. They were like, it's not our time. They told Jesus, it's not our time. We know who you are, son of God. It's not our time yet. You know that. I know that. Isn't that interesting? And Jesus didn't say, oh, you know, I bind you. No, he's just like, well, you got, you got to bounce, man. I got to deliver this guy. And so on, she throws in these pigs. All right, go ahead. Boom, you know. But <laughs> it's, it's a crazy story, right? But, but listen to this. He says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And he's telling this. And he's saying very clearly here, this in no way could be the work of the ministry. It doesn't work this way. Now, this wasn't in regards to the church, but the same concept applies to the church. If there's divisions in the church and we are going in two opposite directions or we are clashing head on, then the work of the ministry never continues on. Now, listen, I am not a divisive person, but I can be. Such are some of us, right? We can be. I would, I would not get up here and say, oh, you know, there's just no division in me. No, listen, we can be divisive. We have to pray that God remove that from us. Because we're not advancing the kingdom of God. We're advancing the kingdom of darkness. The Bible says two are better than one. When one falls, they can help the other and restore them. The Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken. There is power in unity. And he says to them, we are one. Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are fellow workers. You are God's field and you are God's building. So their united effort was to bring maturity to the church. That's what Ephesians 4 and verses 12 and 13 that we just read is all about. Their reward came, listen to this, guys. Their reward came through their faithfulness in their task. You want rewards, be faithful to what God called you to do. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. That's in the next chapter in the first couple of verses. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes and who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one each one's praise will come from God. In other words, let God do it. If you just remain faithful to the task, God will take care of the rest. So then he transitions from a field or an agricultural farmer, if you will, to a master builder, he goes on to say. And I think this is interesting because what he's saying is that, that, that even they belong to God. And the church now is the temple comprised of believers that are the temple. And we are as well the building and we should be building with quality. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. So what is he talking about him building the foundation? He's talking about preaching the gospel. In Romans chapter 15, this is what he, he's talking about, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He, he lays it out right here in verse 20 of Romans 15. 
He says, and so I have made it to my aim to preach the gospel, listen to this, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Lest I should build on another man's foundation. In other words, what Paul is saying is he's saying, listen, I'd gone to places and preached the gospel where I know nobody else is preaching the gospel. This is a, a passage here that a lot of people misinterpret. Listen, you, 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 got, you got people that, that will go and will literally go where someone else is ministering. And, you know, a lot of times people, you don't, you don't get this. You, you don't ever, I, I just got to lay it out simple. You don't ever pull somebody out of another church. You don't ever say, hey, you know what? Listen, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to evangelize. You never evangelize another congregation is the point he's making here. Though people choose where they want to go, that, that's a given. That's, you know, that's between really them and God, um, especially if they're responding to God's leading and directing. But, but if, if God calls you to plant a church, you don't go to another church to do that. You, you don't go and start to filter through that congregation and say, hey, I just want you to know I'm starting a church. And if you want, you can come with me. Well, you're building on another man's foundation now. It's not the way it works. It's not how you do it. And, and at times, those things have to be addressed. Why? Well, the person who doesn't understand that we're not to build on other people's foundations will, in essence, say something to the nature of, well, it's God's church, not yours. They're God's people, not yours. That is 100% true. But God did call that shepherd to shepherd that flock that is true as well. And so in the same way that this person, not this person to understand, this other one has to understand as well that, that each shepherd has a flock that he shepherds. Now listen to this here. There, there are those that, that, that really like to call themselves pastors. I just, I just had this conversation not too long ago. And, and this argument that I got into was because a gentleman got very upset with me because I didn't call him pastor. Now, mind you, the dude's not my pastor, okay? Nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, I didn't know he was going to get that upset, but he got really mad and just didn't like me no more after that. So somebody asked me, why didn't he like you? I says, you know what? He, when I met him, he wasn't a pastor. That, that doesn't even matter. It's just like a dumb conversation. But I'm going to tell you the dumb conversation. Anyways. <laughs> So, like, this guy wasn't a pastor, and then he become, I don't know, all of a sudden, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in my away time, I guess, you know, he becomes this pastor now. So the next time he sees me, I call him by his first name. I'm like, hey, what's up, bro? He's like, it's pastor. And I thought he was joking around. I'm like, all right, man, <laughs> it's kind of weird, but all right. And uh, I'm still doing what I'm doing. He's just like, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ordained now. And I already knew where this was going. And mind you that I wasn't where I'm at today, okay? So please excuse what you're about to hear. So I turned around and I looked at him and I said, I don't care. And then he says, you don't care that I was ordained? I go, I don't care. So you were ordained, big deal, man. And he just says, oh, really? I says, yeah, really? You want me to call you pastor? Is that, are you, that what you want me to call you? He says, well, you should. I said, are you my pastor? He said, no. I said, well, then I'm not going to call you pastor. I'll call you by your name. Dude, relax. Calm down. I don't tie to your ministry, sucker. You know, but. <laughs> oh, he was livid. You will call me pastor. <laughs> and he used that title and took every authority that I had in that organization because he was a pastor. I wasn't, I was a pastor, but I was not the pastor there. So then as he stripped me of everything, he failed to realize I had a couple of extra keys. So the other pastor 
who gave me the keys. I says, hey, dude, got all the keys, man. You know, I don't know what you got going on. I don't know if you want me over there. He says, nah, I don't worry about that guy, man. He's power tripping right now. Oh, all right, then he goes, you still got, yeah, I got a couple of keys. I didn't give him everything, man. He got a little something about it. <laughs> what you need me to do? <laughs> he says, I need you to go in this room and I need you to go in there. I need you to grab this. I said, all right. So, you know, I'm, I'm crazy like that. I go in there and I'm, I don't know why I did this this day. God, you know, I don't know why the Lord allowed me to. I go and I just wanted to fling the doors open. There was nobody there. Nobody was going to see it. It was just me and the Lord. <laughs> I put the key in and I fling the door open and the lights were on and all these people were in there. <laughs> and there he was like this. And this is what he did. And all I did was, and I went and grabbed some, I went and grabbed what I had to grab, you know, and, and I'm carrying it and I shut one door and I'm looking at everybody like, you know, shut the other one. And then I leave, you know, and the guy texts me later and he's like, all the keys. <laughs> all because I didn't call him pastor. I lost the keys, guys. Anyways. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, he has no flock. Nobody's following him. But, oh, he is a pastor. Watch out. I think a pastor is one who has sheep following. Be careful when you love to hear your name come out of other people's mouths. You don't deserve to be a shepherd if that's you. I always tell people here at Living Way, I know I'm not everybody's pastor that attends this church, and I'm okay with that. But for those of you that I am, I thank you. It's a privilege I get to be your pastor. It's a privilege to serve the body of Christ. But it's God who gives us the ministry. We have to be careful how we build, he says. We preach the gospel. We don't build on another foundation. We don't divide the body of Christ. We unite the body of Christ. We, we make it one. We make it together. Listen to this. We are stronger together than we are separated. He says, be careful. Listen to this. I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he built on it. You know what he's saying here? Pay attention to this. He's saying someone else was building on this foundation. That's what he's telling him right here. I've already laid the foundation, but somebody's built another foundation and you guys are building and you guys, something different crept in. He says, I've already laid the foundation. Where, where did we go off here? I've already showed you how to build. Listen to this. And he's saying, take heed how you build. You see, Paul faithfully labored by the grace of God. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Any other foundation, you know what it is? Sinking sand. Matthew chapter 7 and verses 24 through 27. Jesus' admonition is build upon the rock. A solid foundation because if you build on sand, on any other foundation other than Christ Jesus, the house will fall. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire as to what sort of work it will be tested as to what sort of work it really is. What does that mean? When you're building, it better be on the foundation of Christ. You can sound like it, you can look like it, you can act like it, you could even make, make people believe that you are doing it, but guess what? It will be revealed by fire as to what sort of work it really is. And the Bible says the day will declare it. The day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. It will test each one's work. If anyone's work which has been built on it endures, he will receive a reward. So build with those materials that endure, not wood, hay, and stubble. When you're building your own kingdom and you're building your own thing because you want to do your thing, you want to do your agenda, you want to serve God on your terms and do it your way, use the name God, use the word of God, use the Bible, even use the name of a church and a pastor's name that you know for clout. Listen. 
it will be revealed by fire as to what sort of work it really is. Trust me. God is greater than your kingdom. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Imagine serving the Lord all this time, realizing that you were not even advancing the kingdom. You were building your own little empire, and the Lord says, you didn't do anything for me. He don't even give you a, a diamond. He give you a cubic zirconia. <laughs> Sorry if any of you ladies got one of those for your wedding ring. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because I get in trouble. But anyways, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's not real, man. It's not. My husband told me that's the Greek word for diamond. No, it's not. It's not real. <laughs> I better stop. Anyways, let's move on. <laughs> Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Listen to this. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. I want to close there, but here's the point I want to make with you guys. Be careful how you're building. What are you using to build and what are you building with? He's talking about the church. You know how people say, oh, you know, you, know, you, shouldn't, you, know, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. Because the Bible says your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And whoever destroys... His body, the temple, God's going to destroy them. You guys ever heard that? Well, that's a misinterpretation of that passage because it's not talking to you individually. It's talking about the church as a whole. If somebody tries to destroy the church, God will destroy them. The Bible does say in 1 Corinthians 6 that you individually are the temple of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't say that God will destroy you. So collectively as a church, we're the temple, and individually we are. Be careful how you build. 